homeopathic doctor to join Holtorf Medical Group. Her extensive knowledge of nutrition and supplementation complement the integrative of protocols prescribed at Holtorf Medical Group. Her specialties include hormonal imbalances, thyroid disorders, menopause, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, infertility, obesity, and adrenal fatigue. This chat will be available on our website or YouTube channel. Our live feed will begin momentarily. We hope you enjoy the presentation. If we can, I'll answer them later after the talk. All right, so we talked about perimenopause. Is that kind of downhill slope into menopause? Good evening, and thank you for joining Holtorf Medical Group. And we really want to look at the different pathways women head towards menopause. And it's uh, related to which hormone declines first. So progest and most women tend to go down one of these two pathways. The progesterone deficiency pathway is the one that looks like heavy bleeding, periods coming closer together, longer periods, sometimes even incessant bleeding that doesn't it goes on for weeks on end. Then on the mental, emotional side, we see that anxiety. We also see that, so it feels a lot like PMS. On the sleep side, we see insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, and really kind of having this racy, anxious brain. We also, with that heavy bleeding, and this is really the cause often of the heavy bleeding, is we see endometriosis, fibroids, adenomyosis. So those are the causes. It's actually an estrogen buildup that's causing that, and that can all start to happen in this perimenopausal time. Uh, and then on the, on the estrogen deficiency side, it looks a little different. That's when we start skipping periods. We start having the hot flashes, which are that typical symptom of menopause and perimenopause. And we have those night sweats, which is just the same, it's really the same temperature dysregulation. And uh, then we're getting a little bit more of the degenerative symptoms, vaginal dryness, bone loss, which we can't feel, but it starts to happen. And on the mental emotional side, if we don't have enough estrogen, we get depressed. So that's that weepy feeling, it's crying at the drop of the hat kind of feeling like you really don't have enough kind of emotional reserves to deal with the stressors in your life that you used to be fine with. Crying at work, kind of inappropriate, that real kind of shaky weakness, feeling like you don't have your vital force that you used to have. So you might recognize yourself. Now some of you may have unfortunately a combination of those two symptoms. You kind of remember that pathway before you had your last period. Then there's a few other symptoms that could be estrogen or progesterone deficiency and as well as adrenals or thyroid and even testosterone deficiency. The weight gain, that can be a real mixture. The, it can be progesterone deficiency because progesterone is a natural diuretic, meaning that we, would re, we don't retain water when we have progesterone. Estrogen, when we're low in it, the body tries to hold on to some fat because in our fat tissues, we can make peripheral hormones there. So it says, let's hold on the fat, let's hold on the cholesterol, and let's see if we can make some hormones. It doesn't do a very good job, but so we see that middle waist gain. That's usually, it can be, as I said, either progesterone deficiency or estrogen deficiency. Sometimes we get acne, which is you know always a surprising symptom, and that's because when we're young, we have a lot of estrogen and a little bit of testosterone. When our estrogen drops, that testosterone has a little bit more value. But usually, uh, libido starts to decline too, basically just because we're not feeling well. So that's that pathway down, and then we finally have our last menstrual cycle. We really have to wait a year before we declare you because we don't know, you might, have a few more periods before that final year. So the final year has come, and most women think, great, I've made it through menopause now, now it's over, right? And I'm gonna be fine. Some women do fine. Some women, women actually sail pretty well through perimenopause, actually, especially if they're healthy and exercise and you know, pretty lucky with their genetics. So, so yeah, some women do fine, and then menopausally, some women actually do fine and especially those ones that had the progesterone deficiency, for them it's a huge relief because there's no more bleeding. So they think, great, now we can get, go on our merry way and feel well. So what we wanna look at though is what are the degenerative sides of menopause? 
the things that might not show up those first few years but are starting to happen, they might be silent inside the body and they're things we want to correct. Now you might say, but in menopause is naturally, what, natural, why do we need to change these things? Well, in the early 1900s, our lifespan was 56. So, and, the, and we go through menopause, the average time we go through menopause is at age 51. So it was really just a few years of struggling, or maybe not so much. We didn't have so many toxins in the environment. We didn't have the same kind of stressors we had. We didn't have the pollution, all that sort of thing. So really, we don't really know. Where we, we think these women really didn't have many symptoms, but we didn't really get to see the degenerative side of menopause. So let's look at what some of those symptoms are. And most of them looks, we've talked about them, and they look like the estrogen deficiency symptoms. So where are we starting to see that degeneration? So the most obvious one that we've heard about, it's not obvious symptomatically or clinically, but are the bones. So without estrogen and progesterone, actually, we, we're constantly remodeling our bones. But without estrogen now, we're only breaking it down and we're not building it back up. Now, this is painless. So it's not even that achy joints, I'll talk about that in a moment too. There's actually no signs of this, but we do have a bone densitometry. It's a special scan that can be done. It's a very low dose radiation. It's a super easy test to do, and we can find out how much your bones are degenerating. The first couple years of menopause, we lose 3% of our bone mass per year. So it's a pretty big jump if you don't have any hormone replacement. Then it levels off. So again, some women are fine, you know, kind of if you think about extending that for a while. But what happens if she's going to live 40, 50 years postmenopausally? Because many of you here might live to 80, 90, 100 years old. So we want to see how is that going to look. So then what other tissue is starting to degenerate? And that's the vagina and the bladder. So we've got this vaginal dryness that you might have had perimenopausally. So now, so the, the vaginal tissue is not secreting fluid. That's the first thing that shows up. And then the tissue itself starts to thin. And it starts to lose tone. And it actually is not just in the vaginal tissue. So some of you say, you know, I don't, it don't, it's not important to me. You know, I don't, that's, my sexuality is not, that's not the most important issue. But the bladder also. So the bladder tissue also starts to thin. So the first thing we start to see, I'll ask women if they have stress incontinence or even if they're just having to pee a lot. So stress incontinence is if you cough or sneeze and leak a little bit. Now some women have had this because of pregnancy anyway, but if it's starting to show up really in the 40s and 50s, then we know it's due to this uh, hormone deficiency. So that's something we want to correct. I spoke about that a little bit last month too. You know, that's the other thing that happens if the bladder tissue is not supported, we actually get prolapse, and that's where the bladder starts to slide down through the cervical opening. And we do see this with elder women in their, you know, in their um, exams, so it's something we want to prevent. There are surgeries to, do, you know, to repair it, but they're not great surgeries, not something you want to go through. Then there's another thing that starts to show up, some of these more degenerative things. and that's in the joints. So we've got sort of this musculoskeletal in the joints. And it's just a little bit of an achy feeling. Why is that? If you think about pregnancy, when we've got a lot of high, high levels of hormones, estrogen and progesterone, the body is preparing for childbirth so the hips widen out, the joints get really open. So now think about in middle age pulling all those hormones away and then the, the, the feeling in the joints, especially the hips and the low back, maybe the knees is this kind of achy parched feeling. And it's just because we're not regenerating that tissue. There are estrogen receptor sites all over the body on many, many cells. So it's not just about our sexuality and reproduction. And again with this muscle 
uh, musculoskeletal, we get a little bit of weakness in the muscles too. Part of that can be testosterone deficiency, but it really is just starting to look, there's some good studies on the muscles degenerating and it's harder and harder to build muscle mass. And women will say that they work out the gym, they've been doing their same workouts and now they're not getting the same benefits that they used to. And then the other thing is the skin. I gave you all a study on women. Uh, they did a study how old women looked to based on their levels of estrogen. And women looked up to eight to 10 years, we could say older or younger, depending on their level of estrogen. And we actually, it's a, it's a really nice study because it shows at what level, so we can check in your blood and get, and get you to that level. So it's basically just to maintain youth. And we know this intuitively. I have a patient who has two older sisters. I can't remember, I think she said they were twins. I can't remember. One of them went on hormone replacement, one didn't. And they look considerably, um, one looks considerably older than the other. Yeah, so it's mainly the skin. Hair is the other thing. Uh, we can see some hair loss and graying. Graying's a tricky one. A lot of that's genetic. We do have an interesting product that we have from Thailand. It's called Pueraria Marifica. It's an herb and it has a weak estrogenic effect. And we're seeing clinically that some gray hair is, is growing, you know, is being reduced and growing back, you know, the black or the darker hair. We have a couple patients on it right now. One of the doctors who did the studies, he had a friend, he showed us pictures, went from completely white hair to black hair. We'll see who, if it, you know, if it works on some people. It's kind of interesting though. Again, basically when you think about hormones, think about youth. And so what are, we, what are the signs of lack of youthfulness? And it's because of the hormones that will show up in those ways. And then the weight gain, it really just gets harder to uh, keep a healthy weight postmenopausally. Now, uh, the, a lot of this is from thyroid also. So our thyroid function diminishes and so does our adrenal function. But it also can be simply the hormones cardiovascular disease, so we see some degeneration really in the heart. And how do we really know this? Because women have a lower rate of heart attacks than men, right? We've known this for years and years and years. Postmenopausally, it starts to even out. So we really see that it has protective effects on the heart. And then the brain. So we've got two kind of aspects of it. One is cognitive decline mental uh, mental disorders and you know Alzheimer's so I'm sure if you have some friends menopausally say oh meno brain right I keep you just kind of starting to forget names forget words uh, a few nods in the audience so you know if we think even if we don't you, again if you kind of look at this intuitively so something is is not being nourished in the brain it's not going to get better if we go years and years and years without those hormones so there are some pretty good studies on prevention of, you know, Alzheimer's, there are so much new research on it, we're really not finding, uh, you know, a lot of the solutions yet, but the causes are brain inflammation. So that we can really do without hormones, that's basically lifestyle management. And it's the production of the Dow proteins. There was a study I just said recently that estrogen seems to reduce the amount of those Dow proteins in the brain. So that's one of those causes of Alzheimer's. And then the other one is brain shrinkage. And estrogen can also help that. Now progesterone is also neuroprotective. Uh, I've studied, I went to a webinar with a neurologist and he just says progesterone and DHEA, which is an adrenal hormone, are quite neuroprotective. So you just want to do everything we can really to preserve our tissues our nerve endings, uh, you know, and all, all the cellular functions in the body. And the emotions, so it's, you know, obviously it's related here to the brain. Last month I talked to you about how specifically progesterone and estrogen affect the brain. So progesterone, right, without it we feel that anxiety. So it means that with it, what is it doing in the brain? It is helping the brain produce, did anybody remember what neurotransmitter is? GABA, it's a long name. So GABA we call it, you know, it's basically an inhibitory neurotransmitter. 
You actually can take GABA over the counter too. And in some of our supplements, we put it in in these calming uh, chill pill, one of, those, one of those supplements. So GABA, uh, when we give progesterone, now it really doesn't do it so much if we use transdermal progesterone, but if we give it orally, it'll convert to GABA and it's that calming, calming neurotransmitter. We call it nature's Valium. So that's one of the pathways how progesterone affects the brain on this neurotransmitter picture. And then the estrogen pathway is different, right? Without it, we feel depressed. So what we're finding is that estrogen increases the brain's production of, does anybody remember that one? Serotonin. Serotonin is our feel-good neurotransmitter. All those antidepressants, the SSRIs, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Basically what they're doing is recycling the serotonin we have in our brain. But if we're not making it, then there's really not much to recycle. So this is an interesting one too because the SSRIs, were, there's a low dose one now that has just been approved for hot flashes. So there's some correlation on the, this hypothalamic pituitary axis, but we have women who go to their doctors and they list their concerns and their complaints and the doctor gives them an antidepressant. So it does help maybe for some women, women with the mood and I, they, can, they really do work wonders for some people, but we're not getting at the source. If we can get the body to produce those neurotransmitters that we were producing when we were younger, and now, especially if you know that you feel like your personality is really changing now in these few years, then we really know it's a direct correlation. If you've been depressed your whole life, you know, it's obviously a different picture. There might be some genetic components, some other issues. So these are this kind of, this kind of degenerative picture with menopause. Let's see. The other one is increased mortality. So it really is just, it can lengthen our lifespan by having these hormones in it for lots of different reasons. And actually depression, uh, there's a couple studies recently showing that people with depression have a shorter lifespan, kind of earlier risk of Alzheimer's and also earlier mortality. So we really want to preserve the brain uh, because we're living so long. So let's talk about hormone replacement. I'm going to go into the different types and then we'll talk a little bit about the research. I'll kind of interweave it with the pros and cons and the research on it. So we're going to start with estrogen because it was the one that was first discovered uh, in the science, you know, the scientific research. Reading scientific research is very interesting. If any of you are, you know, little bit intellectual that way and you want to start reading them because you'll see a headline it'll come in you know ahead of time magazine and it'll say organic food no better than conventional food so people say oh there's no reason to and then i i was in a class and we did a study and we actually read the entire study it was a meta-analysis and they had taken maybe 20 or so studies and said and come to the conclusion that organic uh, produce really made no difference. We read through them all and one of them was on tomatoes with lycopene and actually it did make a difference and literally the conclusion, the title that was given to Newsweek was not the same conclusion that was drawn within the research. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in the news this way so just be careful with everything you read try to investigate a little bit further or ask your doctor you know further about it so estrogen the first estrogen that was really discovered and created in a laboratory was er, actually the first excuse me the first study done with estrogen was in 1967 and who did they do it on men <laughs> because men had a higher risk of heart disease right and so they said well let's give men estrogen let's see if they have a lower risk of heart disease so what happened they got gynecomastia which is male breasts their libidos went you know through the through the you know the dropped completely they actually had increased rate of, of uh, heart attacks so it was a complete failure but they could multitask, right? So anyway, so you know, it's just interesting to kind of watch how these things go. Then in the 70s, Premarin was discovered. Now, you know, you've probably heard so much about it in this kind of demonic, evil kind of medication, but let's really look at it. 
Premarin means preg is the nickname, the name came from pregnant mare's urine. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. They were looking for a way to replenish hormones in women. So we often do, this will go to animals. For example, armor thyroid is from pig thyroid. It has the exact same molecular structure as ours, and we found that that works great. Come on in, ladies. But Premarin, it worked. So it helps reduce many of the symptoms, and it, you know, it actually worked quite well. But there's a few things that happen. One is that when they've discovered it, when they've actually studied it further, the estrogen in a horse, there are 17 different kinds of estrogen. And in a, fe in a female, a human, we only have three kinds. So it's just really, it's just not a complete bio, you know, molecular match. There's nothing inherently wrong or evil with it. I mean, except for if you're, um, you know, in kind of animal rights, they're not treating the, you know, the horses perfectly, obviously, either. But, um, so there really wasn't anything wrong with it, except the next set of studies, what they did, so they gave women only estrogen. It pretty much got rid of all their, you know, their hot flashes, the vaginal dryness, the mood changes, and all of that. But when we give estrogen by itself, without progesterone, so it's a buildup of tissue. We get that hyperplasia, which means thickening of the uterine lining, and it actually pretty much directly leads to cancer, because cancer is, right, this kind of cellular growth without any kind of breaks on it. So we found out, you know, pretty soon that you have to add progesterone to it, too, which makes sense because as women we cycle, we have estrogen the first part of the cycle, the progesterone the second half, and then the lining, that's what helps the lining slough off when we get our period. So we know we need estrogen plus progesterone. Now they used a synthetic progestin, and I'm going to go back now and talk about the different types of estrogen, and I'll, I'll catch up on that story in a moment. So what are the types of estrogen we have? So we can use oral, and that's what the Premarin is, right? Now the studies are pretty good now that oral estrogen increases risk of stroke. So it's pretty well known if you have any doctor that wants to give you oral, let's say have some other specific reason, according to your health, there's no reason to use oral estrogen. Um, Now, the, and the other side of it is that the oral was the Premarin. Now, we also want to look at the different wording we use. So what's natural, what's bioidentical, what's synthetic, which one's the good one, what's the bad one? First of all, you have to really define it. Everybody's using the words a little bit erroneously. So Premarin is natural. It comes from horse's urine. It's synthesized then in a laboratory, but it is, it's, you know, it's pretty much as natural as you can get. So, but is it, is it bioidentical? Is it the same molecule, the same biology as our, our bodies? No. Synthetic, so actually after Premarin was discovered, then they made a synthetic plant-based hormone. So, but it, again, we found out it's not the same molecular structure, really, and it actually activated too much of estrone, which is not the, the healthiest estrogen we have. So, we've got the oral, we've got the Premarin, and we've got the plant-based ones. There's ogen, there's a few of these. These have been around for, for decades. Now, uh, we, I'm gonna talk about the women's health initiative in just a moment. So the next choice is uh, sublingual. So if you put something that's sublingual, we put it under the tongue, theoretically it will get absorbed in those mucosal layers underneath the tongue and, and so we bypass the stomach where, we bypass the, the, the stomach and the liver. The liver has to do this extra process on Premarin. Remember it says, uh, we don't recognize this molecule, so the liver has to treat it differently, and that's what increased the risk of stroke because there's a clotting factor in there. So uh, if we do the sublingual, theoretically it has, uh, you know, it doesn't, go through that liver's first pass, but it's not perfect. So imagine putting you know, a mint under your tongue, of course you're gonna swallow part of it. So it's a little bit better, it's not great. And then we've actually, when I talked about the three estrogens that women make, so uh, they started synthesizing this in a laboratory. It comes from the wild Mexican yam. It's natural, but it has to be synthesized in a laboratory. If any of you saw the latest uh, Sex and the City movie, 
and the older actress, the older our age actress, she is, she goes on a trip and she forgets her hormones with her and she's slathering light yams all over her skin. And it, so it was a complete joke and a spoof on all this. It does not work that way. It has to be synthesized in a laboratory, but it was pretty close. They synthesize it and it matches our estrogen. So this was called tri-S, but I'm going to just kind of skip over that for now is bi-S. So what it means is two kinds of estrogen that we have. We have three kinds. So this is the two healthy ones. And this is bioidentical. The same molecular structure as our body. Our body takes it in, it sees it itself as self, and it knows what to do about it. So, so far, you know, and uh, the studies are really bad on this one. Again, I'm going to show, go through that in just a moment. So we've got the oral, we've got the sublingual, not that much different. And then we have, so what we've really found is that if the hormone doesn't have to go through the liver. If somehow we could just get it directly into the blood, it would really seem like it's our own endogenous hormone. So we found a way, and that's called transdermal. So if it goes through the skin, it gets absorbed, some of it stays in the fatty tissue, and then it's released on a slow pattern throughout the day, and then it goes in the bloodstream. So the studies are great on this, that transdermal is the best way to go. There are patches. Of, some of them are good. Some of them are too huge and ridiculously uncomfortable. There's a couple good ones. And then if you go to a, you know, a good compounding pharmacy, and we do that here, is we'll compound. We can do a gel. Or it dries quite qu quickly. We can also do a cream. And we'll formulate it. We'll start low, and then we'll just continue up till you get symptomatic relief. And we'll check your labs to see if your levels get to where it's enough to protect the bones and also to protect protect the heart and the brain. So we've got these different types of estrogen. Let's talk about the risks. You know, I thought hormones were bad for you, right? So the Women's Health Initiative was uh, a huge study. It was done, it started out with 96,000 women. There are all these different branches to it. A really interesting study. Um, it was so supposed to take place over 10 years, and they're going to give women estrogen, compare it with women not on estrogen and see if they had reduced heart disease and then another minor outcome they were going to look at breast cancer so what happens the interesting part about so they're looking at the major outcome they're looking at heart disease so if you look at this study a third of the women were normal the third of the women were no, of normal weight a third were overweight and a third were obese so it was already skewed. What is one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease? Obesity. 10% uh, of them were smokers. 39% of them had been smokers. And then the other side is that there were many, many women that had, were beyond 10 years postmenopausally. And there's a different risk factor they've, studied, they've looked at. So we, they stopped the study early because there was a higher risk of heart disease and we thought it was the estrogen. But they kept the branch going. There was another branch in the, another arm of the study, and it was estrogen only, because these women didn't have a uterus, so the, the early knowledge is that you didn't need to use progesterone if you didn't have a uterus. So those women, they kept on the study. This caused a huge outroar. By the way, the estrogen they used was Premarin, for the most part. It was a huge study sponsored by them. So the wrong estrogen, the wrong delivery, and really not the healthiest set of women. It was, you know, it's not it, that much skewed from our population in America, but if you're going to do a study looking at heart disease, you don't want to start out with women that already have a history of heart disease. So that's, you know, what happened. So they took all these women off of uh, estrogen. Now, they're, now what they're doing is reanalyzing the data. One of the latest uh, analyses, very interesting, the women on the estrogen-only arm, they actually had a lower rate of breast cancer. So we always think estrogen causes breast cancer, but we really are discovering that all the faults in that study were the progestin side, which is the synthetic progestin of the study, not natural progesterone, which I'm going to go through. So it's really not the estrogen. And I want to, you know, kind of, how do we put all the studies together? I want you to kind of think about it in a, a certain way, too. If estrogen caused cancer, 
then all young women would have cancer, right? We'd have this huge rate of breast cancer in young women. We see the biggest rate of breast cancer postmenopausally when there are lower amounts of estrogen. Now, if there's a tumor and we feed it estrogen, it will grow if it's an estrogen receptor positive, so we have to be careful. The way I like to think about it is if a woman has gotten cancer, there's some kind of dysregulation. So let's think about a traffic signal. We have cars, we want to go from A to B. If the traffic signal is not working, well, we certainly don't want to send more cars or more estrogen into the traffic signal. However, the cars are not the cause of this dysregulation. And if we don't send any cars there, we're not going to get from A to B. So we really want to sort these things out. And with some women, we have to be more careful. But it's really not the estrogen part that is causing the breast cancer. Uh, they did another study in France, the Fournier study, with 80,000 women. Now, this was a better study. The estrogen, they still use different kinds. They were not controlling really what type of estrogen that they used. But so the estrogen the women that were on estrogen only did have a 29% increase of breast cancer. The women that were on estrogen plus synthetic progestin had a 69% increase in breast cancer. And the women who are on estrogen and natural progesterone, so kind of mimicking the way we are as young women, the risk factor came down to zero. So that was one of the best studies that we've seen so far, and that I implicates the, the really the synthetic progestin. So let's talk about progesterone. Were these studies uh, where they cycle on and off, three weeks on, one off? Or? No, they didn't. Not, not postmenopausally, they don't usually. So that's another talk. Um, there's some interesting research. I just read something recently about maybe one of the reasons why women have a lower rate of, uh, of heart attacks is because when we do shed the blood, we have to create new red blood cells, so it's actually a thinning of the blood. Now, it's kind of a, we've, we've really discovered we don't need to continue cycling. I'll talk about that with the choice of hormones, but we really, there is no health reason to do it. The studies are pretty clear on that. So that isn't the reason why that was going on. So we can give enough estrogen to balance, enough progesterone to balance out the estrogen. So with progesterone, so back when we found out that the Premarin by itself would cause that endometrial growth, they said we need to add a progesterone into it. So they made it in a laboratory. They didn't, I guess the pregnant mares did, the progesterone was not bioidentical. They couldn't do it. It's a large molecule, by the way, so it wouldn't work. Um, so they made Prem Pro, or, uh, uh, Provera, thank you. And then when it's put together, they call it Prempro. So Provera is a synthetic progesterone. And so that we, we, we usually call, they call progestins. So progestins are the synthetic, progesterone is exactly what we make. So with the Provera, now it did stop any of that endometrial growth. It works for that. Now, um, you asked about cycling. So when we're younger, we have estrogen the first part of the cycle, then we have progesterone the second part, we bleed. We, so we can do things two ways. If, when you're perimenopausal, we'll, we'll really try to imitate that. We'll give you progesterone because you're still cycling. We'll try to support that cycling. Postmenopausally, once you're not bleeding at all, once you're not having periods, we can give you enough progesterone so we don't get the buildup of the endometrial lining. And it's pretty clear in the studies that you need 100 milligrams orally. It's, you know, it's pretty clear it's been um, shown. If there's any doubt or if a woman gets any bleeding, we can do a um, vaginal ultrasound. We can see if the lining is thickening. So they started doing Provera, and this is really the culprit of the Women's Health Initiative. The studies are really pretty darn clear on that. And as I talked about that French study, when they switched it to a natural progesterone, so this, we call it oral micronized progesterone because it's this large molecule. It has to be synthesized appropriately in the laboratory. So is this natural? Is it synthetic? You know, what do we want to call it? You'll hear it's natural because it's our same molecular structure. We, we really like the term bioidentical because it describes it perfectly. And it almost doesn't matter where it comes from because our body sees it as uh, its own endogenous production. So it's oral micronized progesterone. So what are the choices? With progesterone, we can do oral, or we can do transdermal, and we can also do sublingual. Sublingual is kind of a good thing for progesterone. So the oral, 
When we give it orally and it has to go through the liver, this time we like it because it helps, when it goes to the brain, it converts to GABA, that calming neurotransmitter. So this is wonderful for insomnia. We can do instant release, we can do sustained release to keep you asleep. The sublingual is a little more instant release, so even though you're just gonna swallow part of it, some will go right in the bloodstream. So if a woman's really having problems falling asleep, we can do sublingual progesterone. The doses are anywhere from, you know, really 25 up to about 400. Most women are on 100 to 200 milligrams. Transdermal, we often start perimenopausal younger women on that. So again, you can put it, it's usually, it has, that's a cream, they don't make it in a gel because it's a large molecule. That one basically helps with most of the PMS symptoms. It can help with the breast tenderness, fibrocystic breasts. Some women feel a little sleepy on it also, not many, but so it's a, a different form. And you know, we can use a combination or either of those. The other thing is the vaginal atrophy, dryness, that we can use a vaginal estrogen. estrogen. We can use, est Premarin makes a vaginal one too. There's no reason to be on that. We can use a bioidentical one. We can compound it, compound it in a pharmacy too. And we really like estriol. That's the weak estrogen that has great affinity for the skin and the vaginal tissue. And if you're getting urinary incontinence, we'll put a little testosterone in it and it'll really tone the bladder nicely. And some women, you know, that, that issue is really completely resolved. Is it vaginal testosterone better for fibroids because it's closer? Yeah, you know, we don't use a lot of vaginal progesterone, but we can. Now, if a woman doesn't tolerate oral progesterone, because some women, it, they get too sedated on it. Candida. Yeah, that's true. It can be, it has some insulin resistance, and she said candida also. The, we can use vaginal progesterone. Yeah, some, you're right, it's a little bit closer to the uterus, so it can make sure there's no buildup. If we have to, we can give it vaginally where you take it every other day for 12 days, six times, so for 12 days, and then force a bleed if we have to. It's only if you're not tolerating it other ways and we, and we want to just use, we can't use continuous hormones. So really this whole choice is we often do cyclical, so we try to imitate the menstrual cycle from when we were younger. We do that at the beginning until we kind of transition to menopause. Some women like to stay on that for a little while longer. Usually they end up not really bleeding much anyway, so we can just stop that. And then we'll give estrogen and progesterone continuously enough so that there's no buildup. So you get the benefits of both. What was the insulin resistance? Yeah, there's some studies about progesterone causing some insulin resistance. You know, I haven't really seen it clinically. I haven't really investigated it much, but there's a lot of talk about it. So your blood sugar would Meaning that, yeah, it can cause um, that you you're, can't tolerate glucose very well. M right, the insulin resistance, basically, if we cut out carbohydrates, we can pretty much solve that anyway. So I haven't really seen a big difference with it with progesterone. Um, you know, I work so much with diet. You, you know, you have to do all these other things. We have to take care of our diet. We have to sleep well. We have to either reduce our stress or find healthy ways to cope with it. And we have to exercise. So... Let's see. And then testosterone. We haven't really talked about that yet. So testosterone is, you know, we think of it as the male hormone. Men, their levels, when we look on a lab test, is up from anywhere from 200 to 1,000. With women, our numbers are about 2 to 80 or maybe 100. So obviously much lower. What does testosterone do for us? It can help with muscle mass. So especially if women have said, you know, I've been working out and I'm not building any muscle mass the way I used to, testosterone can help with that. And it can help with libido. So that's one of the things that, you know, really drops, especially with that vaginal dryness and the anxiety and the insomnia. So it can really help with libido. And then, as I said, if we use the vaginal estriol plus testosterone, it can help heal the bladder. How do we use this? We can do it. There's, uh, they used to, it used to be a synthetic testosterone. It was taken off the market because it um, had uh, clotting, I believe. I've forgotten what it was, but it, was, it had some toxic elements to it. So we can make a bioidentical testosterone, the same molecule that our body makes. So we can do sublingual. That's pretty good with the testosterone. 
and uh, we don't usually do oral. We don't. We try not to do oral unless it has. A, this is the only one where we do it for a benefit, and we can use a cream or a gel also. This one we have to watch when we dose, so we have to go pretty darn slow. So the benefits are increased libido, increased skin thickness and oiliness. So if you think about aging, our skin gets thinner and drier. So with testosterone, it keeps it oilier and thicker. But if we get too much of it, then it leads to acne and facial hair. So I don't usually give testosterone at the beginning if they're low on all of these. Let's get our female hormones nice and robust and then add this in. Some women, this one will look at your blood values and then we'll really judge it clinically. And it gives us, it's interesting what it does the brain too, a little bit of confidence, self-esteem. It can help a little bit with depression. And it also can help with, all three of these can actually help with bone density. So I think that's most of what I wanted to go through with you. It's interesting that the, whenever, you know, I talk about hormones with women, the main thing everyone is afraid of is cancer. But really, the greatest risk, you know, the, the biggest killer of women and men is heart disease. So we really want to focus more on that. And that uh, hormones can help, but then that's actually, you know, a whole other branch. We want to look at reducing inflammation, reducing weight, keeping everything, um, keep antioxidants in our diet, you know, that sort of inflammation, and exercise, quitting smoking not taking any other medications that might increase the risk of stroke or clotting. Any questions? It's okay. I've had the genome testing done, and I just see it as, as even a genetic change, just a picture, a snapshot. But um, several of the things, one of them was genetic polymorphisms in the catechol estrogen metabolism pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So her question was, I'm going to repeat it for the, our online viewers. So her question is, you know, genotyping. So some really great testing now. We can, we, you know, we've, we can do our whole genotype. And there's something called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Basically they are, it's a, it's a genetic difference in the genes and which gene is it and what does it matter. So the other thing about breast cancer is we're looking at it, it's not so much the estrogen, but how the estrogen gets broken down in the body. So it has a couple different pathways. And one of them, there's these two uh, metabolites called 2-hydroxy uh, estradiol and 16. 2 is the good one, 16 tends to have a more carcinogenic pathway. Then there's a whole other pathway that has to do with methylation. So basically what these are is how does our body detoxify? We're doing this on a natural basis. So we have some tests. We want to find out what we can find out what tendency you have genetically. So that's what um, you had done. You found out that you have a SNP in the COMT, which is the more of the methylation pathway. So we can find out what your tendencies might be. And we can also do some measurements about seeing which metabolites are showing up. And that requires further testing. There's a couple different ways. There's a blood test that can be done to measure your levels. Uh, you can do it with a urine test. Uh, and you can, do it, you can do it with a 24 hour urine test. You can also do it with a first morning urine void. So the other thing to do, I actually don't do a lot of this testing anymore. Those, all the kind of the bad pathways happen with oral estrogens and sublingual. And we know if we're giving you transdermal, we're doing our best job to go down the healthier pathway. And then I control it with your other lifestyle management. And then there's some supplements to do. And I'll give you all a list of these now. This is a, that was a perfect question. You know, what can we do to prevent breast cancer also? So there's a great supplement called DIM or I3C. They're basically the same. It's just one is broken down more easily in the digestive tract. And they come from broccoli extract. And so eating your cru cruciferous vegetables can be helpful. It, it comes from the broccoli seed, too. You can actually get broccoli sprout seed sprouts, and you can throw those in a smoothie. Um, so it's a great supplement to do. One of the best supplements, actually, is fl ground flaxseed. There's some great research on it preventing breast cancer. Two tablespoons a day, freshly ground, put it on your granola, put it in a smoothie, put it on a salad. And uh, turmeric, 
That's the antioxidant ingredient in, uh, it's actually it, the curcumin, it's in curry. So that's one of the best antioxidants. Great studies on that for Alzheimer's too. So it's really a great way to reduce that inflammation. And uh, fish oil, another way to reduce inflammation. So those are all the great ones. So I usually just suggest and uh, that we're going down a healthy pathway. I don't do all the testing because I know what I'm. I know what we're doing our best by using transdermal estrogens. And there's a few. I had a list. Let's see. And iodine also. Iodine is great. There's some really kind of more research, recent research on iodine. Iodine is wonderful for any kind of uh, cystic growth, so ovarian cysts, uterine fibroids, uh, especially fibrocystic breasts, really good for that. So we'll measure your iodine levels. It's a urine test that we'll do in-house, and then we'll supplement accordingly. And it also can be helpful. You want to, there's a little bit of parameters about when and when not to use it, and it has to do with thyroid also. So, yeah, so that was a good question. So it's, we're, get, we're just getting so much new knowledge, and what we basically want to do is not kind of jump from one thing to the other. The most interesting headline just came out, I believe it was a few weeks ago, from Yale University, and they said that because this, uproar in 2002 and three, when everybody went off of hormones. Before that, 90% of, of menopausal women were given estrogen, and it was the Premarin, or given hormones. After that, only 10%. Yale University took the research, took the statistics over the next 10 years, so 2002 through 2011, and they said, because after all those women that we just yanked off all their hormones, we actually had increased mortality. So they said anywhere between uh, 16,000 and 90,000 deaths could have been prevented had these women been on hormones. So it's a really interesting question to ask. What is, so basically they said 50,000, the headline was 50,000 deaths could have been prevented if these women weren't taking off their hormones. So what you also want to ask, what are the risks of going on hormones? What are the risks of not going on hormones? And they're pretty clear. <laughs> Osteoporosis, vaginal dryness, uh, achy joints, skin thinning, hair loss, weight gain, uh, perhaps heading towards uh, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, cardiovascular risk going up, depression, lifestyle, you know, really that sense of well-being. And remember that we, you know, none of the science is perfect. We don't have another option. We are going to live maybe even 50 years postmenopausally. We haven't really found any other way to restore these things, but they really do work. Our body recognizes them as an endogenous hormones, and, you know, most women... Also, when we do this kind of treatment, it's not that you feel, wow, this is a great drug. You just start to feel like you're yourself again. And that's the kind of response. We're not looking to feel like we're 20. We just want to feel the way we did maybe 35 or 40 so we can continue on with our careers. So, you know, we want to, I, what my job is to empower you so that you can live the rest of your life fully and living at your purpose. Okay. So, any other questions? Yeah. Um, how do you feel about treating women who've had breast cancer with hormones? Yeah, so it's cheap. The question was, what about treating women who have had breast cancer, you know, treating them with hormones? It is tricky. So when we apply research globally, how does that affect you as an, as an individual? So it's true. If a woman has, e you know, especially currently, if you think of an estrogen receptor positive tumor, they found that if we take away the estrogen, it doesn't grow anymore. That's what tamoxifen is or arimidex. So, you know, we don't want to feed the tumor, but the latest research, um, the latest analysis of the Women's Health Initiative is that the women who were on estrogen only did not have an increased risk. But it's pretty darn risky. We really don't recommend it. We're really liking this Poraria marifica. It acts like a weak estrogen. And it, um, it doesn't have the same effects on the breast. Now, some women are saying, I, I don't care. My lifestyle, uh, you know, my, my quality of life 
has di diminished so much. I really want to be on estrogen and we'll do it, you know, with consent, but it's really not, you know, it depends on how many years they've been out, depends on what kind of hormones they're on. But we do have a list of studies on women with breast cancer who just said, I don't care, I'm going to take the risk, I want to be on hormones, and they went on hormones and there was no increased risk. But again, everything, you know, you have to kind of look inside and make your own personal decision about it. But one thing we can always do with that is we can always use vaginal estradiol even. You can use, um, you know, a basic hormone. We prefer estriol, but you can definitely use a vaginal estriol to relieve some of those symptoms. So there's a few things that we can do. We can give you progesterone too. There are a lot of things we can work around it, and we, you know, we have to. It's a very personal decision, and it's not recommended if someone has, you know, d depending, as I said, how how soon it's been out. So, yeah, yeah. I have a question from an online viewer. Oh, good. A question from an online viewer. She wants to know if she should just if she should go on a low dose hormone if she's no longer getting her period. Right. So it's the question is, should she go on a low dose hormone if she's no longer getting her period? So, you know, what I really want to do is educate you to come in when you're, pre, when you're perimenopausal and you're starting to get symptoms, but some women don't have any symptoms until they are postmenopausal. So, the study also with this Women's Health Initiative is the higher risk is on the women who've been more than 10 years out, past their, past their last menstrual cycle, and if we give them hormones, we definitely, ha we're doing it anyway, but we have to give transdermal ones, we have to be a lot more cautious, we have to see if she has any risk of stroke. But if a woman has just stopped her period, chances are what I would do is find out what other symptoms she's having. Do a bone densitometry and find out if she's uh, losing bone. Find out if, you know, all, if she's having any symptoms. She's not having any symptoms. We might wait a little bit while, a little while. But what we would do is we'd start, if we agreed that, she, you know, she wanted to go on them, we'd start with a low dose estrogen and a, a medium dose of progesterone. I usually start with 50 milligrams to make sure you don't have any side effects. Wait a month and then go up to 100 and the estrogen. Now, one more study too, the United Kingdom came out with a really interesting report because in the United States, we've always said, the lowest amount of estrogen, lowest amount of hormones for the shortest amount of time. The U UK came out and said these are all the benefits of hormones. So weigh the risk and benefit at each level for you personally. And we don't necessarily say go on the shortest period of time because do you want to, when is it okay to start increasing your risk again for Alzheimer's? When is it okay to go back and increase your risk for osteoporosis? You know, most women just feel healthier and they do want to stay on them. But not being on, it, once your periods stop, you're going to really have all these symptoms. So we would certainly, um, if, if you're symptomatic, we would certainly start hormones, both of them. Yeah. Okay. One more question, yeah. With thyroid and adrenal, say you've been on the hormones that can help it, and then all of a sudden they're exhausted and they crash. Will your other hormones also obviously be affected? Yeah. So the question is, it will if you're having some thyroid disorder or some thyroid low thyroid symptoms or adrenal symptoms, will these other hormones kind of crash alongside of it? The thyroid goes, the thyroid molecule goes into the nucleus of every cell in the body, and one of the things that it really oversees is our female hormones. When we're young and we have our first period as a teenager, or e then it's actually the thyroid that does the signaling. So, and actually some women who are missing their periods, we have, I have some young teenagers who started their period and then they stop for several months. When we give them thyroid, it usually corrects. So, they basically, you know, some of my teachers talk about that it's a symphony of hormones. They all work together. Uh, I gave you another flyer, we can post these on the website, and it's a graph, and it shows the hormonal decline of all of our hormones, thyroid, adrenal. The adrenal hormones are cortisol, DHEA, pregnenolone, and female hormones are estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. What happens is they're pretty darn high, pretty much to our 30s, and then estrogen, progesterone kind of do this crazy part during perimenopause, and then they're along the floor, and the other hormones also start to decline. So we want to usually work with them together. And, and I actually prefer to start 
with adrenals and thyroid first or at least together alongside the female hormones. So some women say, yeah, I was 40 and I only needed was a little bit of thyroid, now I feel great and now something, my thyroid, it feels like my thyroid's not working anymore and, it's, and it might be your female hormones or it might be adrenals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she asked if you are at risk for stroke. So what the risk factor for stroke is this is uh, thicker blood, thicker platelets, or maybe this uh, coagulation defect. So if you have that, so you can form a clot. A clot can lodge in the lungs. You get a pulmonary embolism where it can come up and lodge in the brain. That's what a stroke is. So if you have that risk factor, which hormones can you use, basically? So definitely not synthetic progestin. Progesterone is fine. The estrogen, now if there's an increase, we have to be very careful with this one too. We also would do, uh, in, our in our clinic here, we also have a va um, vascular ultrasound. We'll check in your carotid arteries, we'll look at your aorta, we'll look at your femoral and popliteal arteries and see if there is increased uh, plaque building up. So we'd send you to a, to a cardiologist, do everything we can to prevent it if you're insisting it. So the, the transdermal does not increase your risk, but we, if you're more than 10 years postmenopausal, we're going to tread even a little bit more uh, cautiously. Yeah. But then there are some things, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of coagulation defect in our chronic fatigue syndrome patients, so there's ways to treat that too. It's, you know, it's a kind of a different pathway, but it's, it is interrelated. So you do want to get this thinner, healthier blood. Fish oil is another way to do it. Vitamin E. Use some enzymes. If you take them on an empty stomach, they can also help. Low-dose heparin, things like that. Any other questions? Any online questions, Rosie? Any yeah, I've got other? another one. I just don't know if we have time for it. We'll do one more. Okay. She wanted to know, because she doesn't have a thyroid, um, she's taking thyroid replacement. How does that affect menopause? So the, the person is asking, she says she doesn't have a thyroid, so she had a thyroidectomy. We don't, she's not saying why exactly that happened. So she's been on thyroid replacement hormone. How does that affect menopause? If she's on the correct dose of thyroid medication, it won't actually impact menopause. If she's not on the correct dose, which we're finding more and more people are actually not treated optimally, the, their doctors are only going by their TSH level, they're gaining weight, they're fatigued, they're depressed. They say, well, I've been on Synthroid, so they may not be on the right thyroid medication and they may not be on enough. So if those are happening, that's gonna make menopause that much worse. If it's not happening and their thyroid's functioning well, and certainly women and men who've had thyroidectomies can do great with thyroid replacement hormone, and they do fine, and then this just starts to be an independent uh, factor. So, Thank you all very much. We love doing these. We've had some great responses. So we'd love for you, I would love to hear your response. If you have any questions, if you have anything that you'd like us to add, any topics we'd like to, uh, to go over. Next month, I'm not sure we've picked the date yet. Have we picked the date? Probably not. So it'll be in four to six weeks. We are going to talk about weight loss. I'll just give a brief intro, then I'm going to introduce you to Sherry Good, who's our patient coordinator. If you've talked, um, if you are a patient with us, you've spoken to her, she's introduced you to our practice, and she's going to talk about the HCG diet. And um, we'll continue in the future. I will do a talk on thyroid, and I'll do a talk on adrenals, and all sorts of educational. So thank you very much. But we, yeah, I'd love to hear responses. So please, you can post on Facebook or post at the bottom of, of our web page. So thank you very much, everybody. We hope you found Dr. Evans' information on menopause useful. This presentation will be available on our website or YouTube channel. If you would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Evans, just fill out the form below. She offers nationwide consultations as well as office visits in our Torrance location. Next month, Dr. Evans and HCG expert Sherry Good will chat on unique and exciting weight loss therapies offered by Holtorf Medical Group. We hope you will join us either in our office or via live stream. Thank you for watching.